Welcome to the MTA Podcast Series, a weekly audio cast featuring interviews with recognized industry professionals, and your host, Ed Carlson. Tuesday, March 23rd, 2010. There are many definitions of what constitutes a bear market, the most ridiculous of which, and the one most accepted by the investment community, is 10% is a correction, 20% is a bear market. We have no idea who first said that or wrote it, and we have no idea what it means. It is arbitrary. It is without substance. There is, however, a definition of a bear market that we consider true and good, and one which now we would call to your attention. And we'll let today's guest call that to your attention in a moment. Today's guest from Oppenheimer & Company is Carter Wirth. Carter Wirth's work is based on the principles of collective wisdom and behavioral science with particular emphasis on trend recognition, capital flows, and price action. As Oppenheimer's chief market technician, he publishes periodical industry and sector reports as well as daily market comments. Before joining Oppenheimer, Carter was chief market strategist with Aaron Krantz King Nussbaum. Prior to that, he founded Fulcrum Enterprises, which specialized in investment advisory, portfolio strategy, and overall asset allocation and stock market analysis. His work in technical analysis began at Donaldson, Lufkin, and Ginrette, where as a portfolio strategist, he focused on top-down rotation, industry weightings, stock selection, and risk management. Carter is a frequent guest on CNBC, Bloomberg TV, Rob TV, and has been quoted regularly in various publications, including the Wall Street Journal and Barron's, and has lectured before CFA societies across the country. Carter has a BA in international relations from Boston University. Carter Worth, welcome to the program. Thank you, sir. We're delighted to have you today. It sounds like uh, Oppenheimer's busy there in the background. Well, you know, it's uh, another day here on the uh, trading floor, and uh, I spend half my time in quiet places and half my time uh, on a, in a busy place like this, the trading floor where the action is, and uh, I think a little bit of both is, 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 a, is a good balance or blend. So today happens to be a day for uh, a part, you know, participating, if you will, or, or being close to the, uh, the trading desk. I see. Well, I'd, I'd like to actually delve into that a little deeper in a moment. But first, um, Carter, I, I think most people listening to this podcast probably recognize your name from your CNBC Fast Money appearances and, and know that you're at Oppenheimer. Uh, we now know that you have a degree from Boston University in International Relations. Before we get into technical analysis, I'd like you to fill in some gaps for us. What, what happened between Boston University and Fulcrum? What happened that caused you to leave Fulcrum to go to Aaron Krantz, King Nussbaum, and from there to Oppenheimer? And what happened to that degree in international relations? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, it's funny. Starting, you want to start with, with college. The, uh, the college experience is anything you want it to be, as you'll know. And in my case, it was a, probably a fairly average experience. Did my share of work and did my share of uh, taking advantage of the, the the fun things in college. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. And uh, international relations wasn't anything of, uh, let's say, particular uh, an acute interest. It's just that I, I've always really been interested in history, uh, literature, uh, uh-huh. more so than the sciences. And so uh, that seemed like a broad uh, subject that would uh, afford me a chance to do a lot of reading uh, and cover a lot of different subjects as well as to uh, sort of complement my is- interest in, in history. It just broaden it out a bit. So that was, uh-huh. the, that was the reason why uh, I chose that particular uh, subject as my major. Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. other than that, it's not, it's not particularly relevant to what I do now, which I suppose is often the case in life. You uh-huh. find you're on a different track altogether. Right. And uh, from the university, uh, what was your first uh, position? Yeah, the first, uh, what, what you'd say, um, position of responsibility was uh, working as an, a fundamental analyst at Value Line, the, uh, the research uh, company that founded, right. as you'll know, the, the one-page format, which Morningstar, of course, copied and got into and has made a big success of, first in mutual funds and then uh, in, and an interesting story in the sense that uh, Value Line was founded uh, by someone named Arnold Bernhardt, who had worked at Standard & Poor's, which was, of course, the very first uh, effort at trying to pr- pr- produce one-pagers. They used to have the tear sheets. And he left uh, Standard & Poor's the height of the depression with $400 and a mimeograph machine, and he founded Value Line. And, uh, oh. you know, the, uh, many decades later, it's still one of the most recognized, um, let's say, uh, independent research efforts on the street. So that was an invaluable experience, and I, I was there uh, as a fundamental analyst for two years. 
Okay. And uh, at some point you started your own firm, Fulcrum. Well, yeah, that, that was further down the road. The, uh, the, the immediate thing after Value Line, and this is really where the, where the technicals came into play, is I was hired on by the chief investment officer at Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jan Rett. So okay. there was, uh, you know, they were uh, on the boutique side at that point, not a, a bulge bracket, but a very fine place, as all will know. And uh, your classic industry analyst, 35 or 40 of them, and then uh, a generalist who was, the again, the chief investment officer. He happened to be chairman of the investment policy committee, chairman of the stock selection committee, so forth and so on, and would basically devise all top-down strategy. And I was hired on to work with him, and in fact, it was just the two of us in the strategy group in, in addition to support staff. And, and that was really, I think, one of the things, speaking about international relations, that was a more macro kind of approach. He appreciated my uh, uh, my interest in, in the bigger picture rather than studying companies at a granular basis, income statements, balance sheets, Q's and K's. And so I, uh, it was good for me and it was good for him. And, and that's where I was first introduced to uh, the real study or the discipline study of supply and demand, otherwise known as, as charting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, then take us from there on through uh, on to Oppenheimer. Sure. So uh, then I, I, I was there for uh, about five years, and uh, I left uh, and went off with the person that uh, arguably changed uh, the course of my life in the sense of a professional way. Uh, his name was uh, Vince Boning, and he was the technical analyst, chief market technician there at Donaldson Lufkin. And had been there for quite some time, and it was on the it was in the autumn of his career, a man of about seventy at the time, and was uh, looking to basically uh, not retire, but to just pull back, if you will. And so I left really as an apprentice to study at his knee, to learn at his knee, if you will. Uh, and I, it was it just uh, was very clear to me that this was the route I needed to uh, to go. So I left my. A role as a strategist on a fundamental basis at DLJ to go and pursue, literally like apprentice, uh, just the basic study of charting. And in fact, um, just to put some color on that, and I think it's relevant, two things are interesting. One, what he asked me to do. I had to do the charts by hand. No computers allowed for one full year. So I would draw charts hour after hour after hour. With, we, I remember changing the lead and the pencil, a mechanical pencil, a draftsman board, and I would update the charts. And he said, I want you to get the rhythm and feel of a chart and how how the volume expands, how the how the stock closes in the range of the day, and so forth and so on. I think that's, uh, it, to this day, one of the more invaluable experiences I've had. And the second uh, thing that's very uh, interesting about this is this is, uh, he was, one of the oldest practitioners uh, in the in the business in the area of uh, technical analysis, and to put some uh, teeth into that, or to give you data, let me let me put it this way: mm-hmm. yeah. uh, Vince Boning was at Fidelity in the 1960s, early 1960s, and this is when uh, you know efficient market theory was making its way through business schools. Eugene Fama uh, mm-hmm. creating something that, of course, we all know is is ridiculous, uh, <laughs> and and it's actually all of the academics have have admitted mea culpa. Uh, everyone knew it at the time, but they didn't. So it swept through business schools, and he, Vince Boning, would hide his charts in the bathroom at Fidelity. True story. And he would be in a meeting, and they said he would excuse himself, and he would then go look at the chart, and he'd come back and say, I think this one's good or this one's bad. <laughs> now, they looked at the charts while they're sitting there talking about price to cash flow, price to sales, price to earnings, so forth. And so then, uh, just to round this out, this is one of the very first practitioners. In fact, as you'll know, many of this, many of these things hail from Springfield, Massachusetts. Charles Dow was from Springfield, Mass. And the authors of the seminal work on the subject of technical analysis, Edwards and McGee, mm-hmm. were from Springfield, Mass. And mm-hmm. Vince Boning knew Edwards and McGee personally. And he, in turn, spent a great deal of time in Springfield, Mass. You're talking about literally Charles Dow to Edwards and McGee to Vince Boning. And here's a man who goes from Fidelity to ultimate Leg and Company, predecessor to Leg Mason. White Weld, the preeminent white shoe firm of its day, which was bought by Merrill Lynch, as all will know, to, when they wanted to dress themselves up from Main Street to investment banking, and then finally, ultimately, ending up at Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jen Rett. And that's really the clincher, because BLJ only did fundamentals. In mm-hmm. fact, this industry standard, as you'll know, Institutional Investor Money's II poll, DLJ ranked number one for 12 years in a row. No one's come close to that, and yet they saw the wisdom of this work. 
uh, this particular uh-huh. approach to technical analysis. So I was struck by that. I left with him, and uh, I've never looked back. Um, to your question about Fulcrum, I went on and uh, founded an advisory business that was based largely on the things that he had taught me, uh, and we worked in conjunction. And then at some point, of course, he was not able to continue on, and I ultimately gravitated back towards the uh, the big sell side uh, shop, if possible, and then uh, that gave rise to to Oppenheimer. I see. All right. All right. We're going to continue with Carter Worth in a moment, but first a reminder that on April 6th, we'll have from Dracon Capital and CNBC's Fast Money as our guest, Guy Adami. Carter, um, I started the podcast with a bit of a teaser, um, sharing with folks your comments on uh, what what does and does not constitute a bear market. Actually, I, I only mentioned what does not. Why don't you share with everybody your uh, litmus test for a bear market? Sure. I guess the, the quote that you had started out this uh, conversation with was uh, referencing a piece written by Oppenheimer in, in November of 2007 calling for a bear market. In fact, uh, and I'm pleased with that piece. It, it, it is, I think, as far as I can tell, and I've looked around, the first uh, firm on the street, both in writing and, and of course, uh, on CNBC, to declare uh, a bear market. And really? What, what a bear market it was, yes, one of the biggest since 1929. And uh, the, the thing that I was trying to poo-poo or make fun of is this whole notion of 10% of correction, 20% of bear market. Uh, that, that's an arbitrary, who, again, who made that up? Mm-hmm. I've looked the world over. I've looked in Wikipedia. I've looked on my, I have a first edition books going back to the 1890s on markets, charting. There, there's nothing written in any one of them. It's one of these bizarre things that's out there. It's accepted as the gospel truth. Well, I just don't know what it means. I do know, as taught to me, there is a, a more lasting definition, and it is simply this, the direction of the smoothing mechanism the 150-day moving average. If it's rising, the stock, currency, or commodity is bullish. If it turns flat and starts to head down, the stock, currency, or commodity index is bearish. And and that simple rule alone uh, keeps one in the primary trend, yes? And that was in the cusp of turning down in the, in the autumn of 2007. Well, I'm, so. I'm sure you, you, you uh, would recognize that uh, 150-day moving average is uh, a little different than the consensus. Most people are talking about the 200-day moving average. Exactly. How do you come to uh, uh, rely on well, the 150? There, what's so interesting is the 200 is the default, but in every meeting I go to, just what you've said comes up. Uh, why the 150? And I, I have a reason, and I'll tell you. Uh, uh, but first, I say to people in big meetings, small meetings, biggest hedge funds in the world, biggest mutual funds in Boston, well, why do you use the 200? And interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, you won't believe I have had three answers in 18 years. Three. And they're all the same answer. The first is, um, uh, um, well, uh, it, that's what was on my computer when I, what? <laughs> when you when you sat down, that was the default on your computer, on the software package that you just and you just started driving accordingly. Okay, so the answer is that that's a, the answer is they don't know. The Please second is the somewhere. same. It's interesting, the same answer, but it's different ways. Well, um, well, uh, uh, everyone else is using it. Uh-huh. Well, that's not an answer either. That's the same answer as the first. They don't know. And the third, it's 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 more straight. They shrug their shoulders and say just that. I don't know. Well, if you go into the literature again, if you look into the subject of moving averages, there's nothing substantial that's written on the 200-day moving average. It's another one of these myths, like 10% is a correction, 20% is a bear market. In fact, go to Wikipedia. It was popularized, I think, by William O'Neill. It became, uh, in Investor's Business Daily, it became the default on various programs, like a Bloomberg, for instance. Um, but what's interesting is really to go back and try to figure out in history, which is what's important, where the moving average was first introduced. And so if one looks at the seminal text on the subject, Edwards and McGee, all three, 400 pages of it, do you know how many pages are, uh, there are on the moving averages? No. None. Zero. It hadn't been done yet. There is a major contributor to the, the field of technical analysis. Uh, uh, he is a controversial figure, to say the least, and in many ways, I think in his later life, his work has uh, gone off the rails a bit. But that being said, his, his contribution to the subject, uh, use of moving averages, 
uh, Mr. Joe Granville, he, as far as uh, I know, is the very first person to introduce and do work on uh, the 150 moving average. And it was then uh, used in the old publication, S&P Trendline, and it is uh, everything that I can uh, see the right one to use. Uh, Vince Boning used it, and we spent a lot of time backtesting it at DLJ. Uh, so that's the long answer, and there's some reasons why I think its efficacy is high. But what's important, proof by the contradiction, why the 200? And sadly, there's never been an answer given. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's move ahead. Um, you, let's see here. You wrote, let's see, uh, back in July of last year, you published a report on the Shanghai Composite, and you wrote, note how far the Shanghai Index is above its smoothing mechanism, the 150-day moving average. Too far, too fast. My, my question for you, Carter Worth, yes, is please. what constitutes too far, too fast? Right. It's, uh, uh, it, it's subjective. Uh, that's the first thing. There's no, there's no, in fact, there's very little math in anything that I do. And that's the important, uh, part, I think, about this. And, and, and anything that has, uh, good value, right? If it's mechanized, you can easily hit a computer program and find percentage of stocks above their 200 moving yeah. average, for instance, yeah. right? Or the, the number of days or, uh, uh, let's say percentage above in terms of sheer math. Is it too steep? Uh, I rely more on the visuals but specifically two data points. How many uh, duration and magnitude, in terms of duration, how many months have gone by since the security has had a relationship with the smoothing mechanism? And it, it, you'll find it typically can't go much more than about uh, seven to eight months where a stock has been in a steep, uncorrected uh, advance, where no one has taken profits, no one's taking profits, no one's taking profits. It becomes very one-sided, lopsided. And at that point, and that is the point, I think, at the Shanghai there in August of, of last year, always asking oneself, and I try to do this every morning, who's the incremental buyer from here? And uh, that duration and then magnitude, it's when the day-to-day -day trading starts to start moving up no longer to 45-degree angle, but starts getting more like 70, 80, even 90 degrees. And so it's the cumulative effect of how many months since any normal profit taking has, uh, has taken place. And two, when the most recent day-to-day -day action on a one, three, five-week basis gets incredibly steep, uh, then the, the, the sort of adage too far, too fast is applied, and then, uh, well, so be it. Uh, mm -hmm. More often than not, <laughs> they, they come down. When you when you say who is the incremental buyer from here, it makes me wonder. Uh, perhaps uh, that's a good time to be looking at the commitment of traders report and asking: Are there any more incremental buyers here? I Do you ever use the COT? I, I don't. I don't. But I mean, that would probably be something one could do. And there's endless numbers of data points one can rely on. I think the simplest is Bass. In fact, all that I am relying on is four data points: right, high, low, close, and volume. The moving average, the smoothing is derived from price, so it's it's simply a derivative of price itself. But those four data points is the only thing I've ever looked at. Okay. In the little bit of time we've got left yes, here, and I'm talking about two minutes. Okay. Um, let's let's take a look at the exact opposite situation. In October of '08, you wrote a piece specifically on capitulation, and you used the example of Aubrey McClendon, the CEO of Chesapeake Energy, being forced to sell all his stock. Uh, I think I've already got my question answered, but I wanted to address this anyway. How do you quantify capitulation, and is this related to your principles of collective wisdom? Uh, I think it is. I, you know, in, in, in many ways, uh, that call not quite as timely, frankly, uh, as the call at the top, in the sense that the market uh, went on and made uh, incremental new lows in March. Not all stocks made new lows, which is what's important, right? The, the number of lows was at a, at a peak in the October-November period. In March, semis, many retailers sort of did not make new lows, so it looked like capitulation. Uh, went and stuck my neck out. Obviously, in general, equities went lower. Um, but it was trying to key off of the epic number of new lows and the off-the-chart volume that was mm -hmm. uh, taking place. And, in fact, those moments there in October still marked the highs for VIX as well as for uh, the, sp the spike in, uh, in rates where LIBOR went to almost zero um, to the downside. So, I mean, if you look back in history, the capitulation low will ultimately be qualified as October, November, even though the S&P itself went on to make new lows in March. Mm -hmm. Carter, we're out of time, but gosh, it's been great having you with us today. Uh, before we conclude, is there anything else you'd like to mention? 
Uh, well, I, I think simplest is best. Yeah, that's the only thing I, I, don't, I don't use oscillators. You know, there's so many of them. How, which day do you drive your car with which one? Uh, the screen gets awfully crowded, you know, and it's, it's choi- prone to error, uh, also pilot error, using one, not using another. I think keep it simple is probably the only thing that I would say has, has, has been invaluable to, and I remind myself of that every day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Well, that wraps up today's MTA podcast from Seattle. I'm Ed Carlson. You can follow me at seattletechnicaladvisors.com or contact me at ed at seattletechnicaladvisors.com. Send us your comments and suggestions. Let's keep our stops tight. Good day.